gotta have this. You never know. I may want to do some pastels. You never know about the weather. Comforts everything when you travel. And I can't go anywhere without a chicken. Don't mind me, I'm just getting ready for a quick trip. You know, whether you're a jet setter or an armchair traveler, going to new and different, even exciting places is a great way to gather up ideas for your home and your garden. In today's show, I want to take you on a journey to some inspiring destinations. No, I don't think so. I gotta get going here. Yeah, it seems like I always forget something. Here we go. I'm here at the Elms in Newport, Rhode Island. Wow, what a place. You see, this is one of a series of estates and mansions that's maintained by the Preservation Society of Newport County. Now, this particular garden is a great classical example. One of the things that I love about it is, well, there's this sunken garden. Now, by definition, a sunken garden is a formal garden set below the main level of the ground surrounding it. And believe me, they had to do a lot of digging in the dirt to restore this thing several years ago. Trudy, I have to say, I am totally knocked out by the transformation that's occurred here. The last time I was here, well, there was virtually nothing back here. Well, when this garden was uh, restored in 2001 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the elms in this property, this was a heap. Every bit of sculpture had been destroyed or vandalized. Mm. None of the fountains worked. None of these gardens were in place. This has undergone a major, major transformation. It certainly has. And it's so historically accurate because you have all of these documents That's from right. the period. The garden was started in 1907. And one of the things that we were lucky at finding were the blueprints, I guess, of the, yes. of the garden itself. And they were blown up into huge, huge sizes and large pieces of paper were laid along these banks. Almost like you were laying out a parquet floor. Exactly. For this and garden room. Punched through so that each one of these scrolls is exactly where it was in 1914 when the garden was created to begin with. So That's it's a wonderful, in the dirt kind of restoration conservation story. Well, it's such a beautiful example of classical revival here in New Newport. This is a very hard garden to maintain. It requires a lot of attention. And precision. And precision. With all these clipped hedges. That's which right. is really what brings that formality to the top. Imagine being a guest of the Berwins and walking down the steps of that house along this broad expanse with these beautiful beech trees that were obviously not as big then. Well, that's one of the spectacular elements of the right. property. And then coming up to this French pavilion designed after the Petit Trianon at Versailles, walking down those stairs and voila, there's this magic sunken garden. The element of surprise. Oh, just wonderful. Yeah, no, it is, it is. What a treat for visitors. And then as you approach it, you see that beautiful alley and you look to the right and you look to the left and you see these fountains. There were three fountains along the Allee. All three of them had been vandalized and damaged over decades. Really? So they all three had to be built from the ground up. Yes. And that was really one of the most important features of the gardens. Right, because so they, they had were to focal be points exactly. at either end, yeah. yeah. And the Allee itself, I think, is unique because at the beginning of the restoration, it too was covered with massive amounts of debris and compost and uh, it had no line to it. All of these trees are newly planted except for that beach. Mm. They reflect what had been there again based on the design plans from 1907 and 1914. I know the Preservation Society is very proud of this restoration work. Thank you.
I'm in the Breakers, which is the Vanderbilt Mansion here in Newport, Rhode Island. And let me tell you, it's quite the place. The Breakers is one of 14 historic properties and landscapes that the Preservation Society of Newport County protects and maintains, making it the state's largest and most visited cultural organization. With the mission of preserving the architectural heritage of Newport County, there's a lot of work that goes into making these properties available and appealing to the public. Lots of people see the Breakers every year, over 400,000 visitors. Now, some of the touches that make this such a special place are, well, flower arrangements like this, cut fresh and delivered daily. Becky, these flowers are just gorgeous. Yes. Mmm, this peony, smell yes. that. Oh. <laughs> I just can't believe how many flower arrangements you produce for all of these houses. And we do probably 13 to 15 arrangements daily, you know, throughout the houses. We have a crew that goes out in the morning and replenishes the flowers and replaces if there's some that are too far gone. Right. So Becky, when you're creating an arrangement, give me an idea of what you think about. It all depends too on the container. You want to do the appropriate size. They usually say... Yeah, it needs to be in proportion. Yes, proportion. But I usually start off with my greens, so I build like um, a nice little nest uh -huh. to hold yeah, um, some flowers. Great. And then I go in with my big ones, my big bulky ones, mm -hmm. and then I kind of work my way out with my smaller ones. Sure. So you create a framework yes. first with the greenery. Yes. Yeah. And yep. then that gets your size, and then you fill in with the fill big in. bold flowers like yep. you've used here, the roses and I see chrysanthemums. Yes, and then I go in with like status uh -huh. or just where I feel smaller, like there might smaller be a hole. Smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then just start filling in. Yeah. Now this Lazy Susan is something that I use at home and it makes it really it's easy, great. doesn't it? It you can does. Begin to move them around. Yep. You just do a colossal job here. Oh. Hats off to you. Thank you very Keep much. Up the good I work. appreciate it. <laughs> You're <laughs> Thank welcome. you so much. Founded in 1766 by a Protestant religious group known as the Moravians, the town of Salem has a deep and rich history. The Moravian church and Salem residents kept meticulous records and accounts of their lives, their interactions, their buildings and landscapes, and their evolution into the town of Winston-Salem. On a recent trip to North Carolina, I had the privilege of touring the town with the president of Old Salem Museums and Gardens, Reagan Folan. Reagan, it's such a thrill to be back at Old Salem. It's such a special and really unique place. It really is. You know, the Moravians founded the town of Salem in 1766, and today we interpret life back then with these beautiful historic buildings. Oh, and they've been so well cared for and beautifully restored. Thank you. We're really proud of that, and, and it just really enhances the visitor's experience to see life as it was in these original buildings. And of course, I love the gardens. Well, of course you do. <laughs> We're really proud of the historic gardens here, and I really think it makes um, this whole town come alive with all that beauty. Well, it's, it's so layered and so comprehensive, and there's so many aspects of Old Salem that animate this place and bring it to life. I completely agree with you, and the gardens clearly are at the top of that list. It's a beautiful fabric, really. It is, it is, thank you. Reagan, we can learn so much from the past. What do you think a, a visitor to Old Salem today would find relevant to their lives? Well, I think there's so much to learn from the past. Um, a great example is at the Mitch House, where you see a kitchen garden sure. that's really relatively small, but right. really supported Manageable. the family. Right, yeah. and anybody could go to their home and do the very same in a suburban lot in their own backyard. And of course, Reagan, with so much interest in growing your own food, local food, you can come here and see great organic and sustainable practices in these gardens. Without question. And I think it's really important for children to learn, you know, where their food comes from, learn more about gardening. Hopefully we're cultivating our next generation of gardeners. Well, I couldn't agree more. But you know, it's interesting. So many of the things that the children who were here, the Moravian children, 
uh, what they were learning is really no different than what you're teaching today to the children who visit this place. And that's really what we try to get across to children today, that we can learn from our past, it informs the present, and children back then were learning many of the same subjects, maybe a little bit differently, but sure. it's, it's basically all the same. And I think it really resonates with children when they realize that. I think so too. Well, keep up the great work here at Thank Old you. Salem. Thank you. Real I pleasure to that. be here. Thank you. We're thrilled to have you. So Eric, these cucumber seed that we're planting, are these the ones you were telling me were from the late 19th century? We know they at least go back to around 1875. And so this is something that you've discovered recently? Yeah, just this, just this past winter. Well, let's plant a few of them. Okay. So what are you going to do? You're just going to press uh, one or two? Yeah, I just press them in and cover just them up nice, like that. Nice, loose soil here. Yep. Very rich. Maybe put one right here. Yeah. There we go. What do we want to do? Kind of a grid, planting them about every 10 inches apart? Yeah, I'll do 10 or even 6. So we'll get these covered up just about a little over an inch of soil over the top of them. Mm -hmm. You know, you all have an amazing seed saving program here, don't you? We do. We save save a lot of seed and have over the years. Well, that 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 reputation's grown. This started back in the 70s? Mm-hmm. 73. 72, 73 yeah. was when the landscape restoration started. How many different varieties of vegetable seeds do you guys keep here? About 350 on the shelves. We don't grow them in the gardens every year, but let me really? let me show you over here. Okay, great. Oh, you got quite a little setup here, Eric. Yeah. Wow, look at these seeds. My gosh, this is a gorgeous mosaic. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me a little bit about the seed saving program that goes on here at Old Salem. We save, I mean, on the shelves, we have about 350 different vegetable varieties. Um, we grow nowhere near that in the gardens each year, yeah. but we try to just cycle Rotate through. Rotate them, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and just sort sense. of pick what's available, um, what's about to lose viability. Well, what if you want to do it at home? Uh, let's say you've got you know, like this older couple you were talking about, you know, there's that cucumber that's been in their family since the 1870s. What if someone has a similar seed that they want to continue to save? What are some tips on, on collecting, drying, and preserving them for the next, for planting next year? After you let, just let the seed dry as right. long as you can on the plant. Sure. Um, bring it in and just get it clean, get all the chaff off. Right, um, right. And then store it somewhere Cool, dry, and dark. Well, I have this aunt who actually saves a lot of seed, and she she actually puts them in jars and puts them in the deep freezer. Yeah, that's a great way to extend the viability even longer. Well, it's certainly dark and cold in there, and if she has them in jars, it's dry. Mm -hmm. Some of this stuff is so gorgeous, like this corn. Look at the colors with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's John Hawk corn. It's a Piedmont, South Carolina. Would go back to about how far? About 1820. 1820s. 1820s. So. My mm -hmm. gosh! And look at these peppers. Those are gorgeous. Yeah, these are a bunch of pepper that's been it's been grown here in the gardens for at least 30 years. That's, those are just beautiful, and that's from last year's crop, and they're mm -hmm. still holding that kind of color. Very good. Well, this is all very inspiring, Eric. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. What's a road trip without experiencing the local food scene? On my last trip to Memphis, I had the opportunity to check out a restaurant whose casual fare rivals the creativity of any white tablecloth venue. Here's a delicious collard green recipe. Yes, that's right, delicious, from Chef Michael Hudman of Hog and Hominy. Well, we first kind of got into cooking with some of our grandmothers. We used to go over to their house on uh, Sundays. Every Sunday, same thing. You know, you get up, you go to church, Mama's got lunch prepared. Our grandmother's always adapted southern food. She'd always go to the market. It's like Friday, she'd go to the beauty shop and go to the market. You know, that was like her ritual. And she'd always get two, uh, two sackfuls of Two sackfuls of collards. She'd say a half a sack of collard greens can feed a big boy, so. The process of our collards is we start with bent and bacon. Render that down with a little bit of that Georgia olive oil or whatever. If you're gonna make it for probably like four people, you're gonna use a couple good tablespoons of olive oil just to get that bacon rolling and then. Like four strips of bacon yeah, cut up. Yeah, four strips of bacon cut up. So once the bacon starts to do its thing, starting to release out, mixing with that olive oil, we're gonna add in our onion. So just one white onion, one Spanish onion, or whatever onions in season, whatever you can find, you know. Season our onions. And then we're gonna add in a secret ingredient 
which is uh, this induya. One of the salamis that Andy and I ate when we were living in Italy. It's uh, made by uh, Aaron Winters, our head charcuterie guy. It's, it's a completely spreadable salami, so if you look at it, it's been cured, but it's still very, very soft. We always just met like a thumb-sized piece of induya. If you had too much of that stuff, don't blow your head. Yeah, it's pretty hot. Off. It's pretty hot. Um, but if you don't have that, you can leave that out and add maybe like a little smoked paprika to it. You cook you that want. down in a paste. Yeah, yeah, paste it out. Yeah. And then add the collards. And then that's when we add, so like I was saying, if you're gonna do a grocery bag of collards, like a big paper paper bag for four people, it should be enough. Yeah. So you pick out the stems, you kind of hand tear it, and then you put it in there with it, add the, uh, the pork stock, and uh, cook it down. So this is, our, this is our pork stock. We roast off pork bones. Add some prosciutto to it, a little bit of mirepoix. That's what we're gonna cook the collards in. Then turn it on a simmer and let it go for like an hour or 45 minutes, just depending on how you like it. And then um, if you're going right from the pot to the table, add your hominy. If you don't have fresh hominy, which is kind of hard to do, yeah, two cups of canned hominy wrenched off is, is pretty, it's, it's cool. When you think of the Old South, one of the first things that comes to mind for many people is the image of antebellum architecture. You know, big houses and big columns. That's especially true here in Natchez, Mississippi, where seemingly at every turn, there's a handsome example of pre-Civil War style. It's almost like stepping back in time. My goodness, Jenna, the place just looks great. Thank you, Alan. It's so beautiful. Thank so good you. to be back. Oh, I'm so glad to have you back in Oh, and look room. at these flowers. Looks oh, like you cut them off you. the ground. We like to bring the outside in, and when the camellias are blooming, and, um, you know, of course, Japanese magnolias. It's yeah, just look at that color. Lots of color. Why don't we take a look outside? Absolutely. Jenna, these magnificent live oaks, they frame the house so beautifully. Thank you. They're Very old. Gorgeous. You know, you'd think these, these trees, this one was probably here 200 years before the house was built. Right, very yeah. old. The style of the house is Greek Revival on this side, That's but it's right. different on the back side. When you drive up, it's Greek Revival, and um, then in the back, they couldn't let go of the federal style. You know, the, the facade of this house is so monumental and majestic. Yes, when you drive up, it just kind of speaks to you. It does, it's a wow moment. It was um, built for that. What people don't realize is when you go inside, it was, it was also built for hospitality and family. And I think the porches give it that monumentality. It's the gallery porches, mm -hmm. and we actually sit out there and have um, breakfast oh, and um, yeah. have wine on the front porch in the <laughs> <laughs> afternoon. So. Yeah. So the house, we're, what, 1836? 1836 is 36. when they started building it. So actually it was finished in 1840 um, for, and they wanted to finish before a party was thrown. Oh, so they had a deadline. That's right, 1842. <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> 1842, they had a, a ball for Henry Clay here, and it was called the Night of 3,000 Candles. And so there were candles hanging from the trees. So they used 3,000 candles? Yes. Oh my gosh, that's a so lot of candles. It was, it was um, you know, so the house is built for entertaining. It really was. But the family lived here, and um, it really, it feels like home. Well, you know, on such a beautiful spring day, I'd love to see how your camellias are doing. Absolutely, let's go see. Wonderful. Jenna, it's really not officially spring, but here in Natchez, you couldn't tell with these magnolias in bloom. I know it. The Japanese magnolias are glorious. They are. They're putting on a show for you today. They are definitely on the stage today. <laughs> and the camellias, well, they're are they sort of wrapping it up now? They are wrapping it up in mm. time for the azaleas to bloom. So our right. camellias start probably about October. We have, you know, the different bushes that yeah. will come out in the pinks and the reds and the whites and the, you October know. October till March. All, all of the these way. different camellias. How we have something gorgeous. blooming all the time that to is bring marvelous. inside. You know, the design of this, the house, the ground, it just, there's, there's something tranquil about it, the way it all hangs together. Yeah, that's why we uh, actually purchased the house, is to, because it's so peaceful, mm -hmm. and especially on a day like today. It's so great to see you again. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Alan. It's wonderful to come back to Devereaux and yeah, see it in so such good, good order. Hello, 
John M. Down store. This is Lemon Abner. One of the most welcome greetings on radio for nearly 25 years. The Lum and Abner Jot'em Down Store and Museum not only chronicles the history of the iconic radio program, but strives to preserve an important era of American life. It's one of these places that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Stores built in 1909 and 1904, Dick Huddleston's big store and the Little McKenzie store where the two stores that were the models for the Lemon Abner radio programs for almost 25 years on the radio. Seven movies, very famous today as Nostalgia, Old Time Radio. And it all comes back to this little place right here. 20 people live here now. The two young fellas, Chet Locke and Taffy Goff, grew up in Mina, which is just 20 miles from here. They were the class clowns in school, and they ended up in Chicago for 10 years, and Hollywood for 10 years. Just uh, put this part of the country on the map, really, but it was old time radio, hillbilly humor, clean. It makes an awful pretty bed of bars. I love that. We have people that come a thousand miles just to come here, spend a few hours to around and go home. This was their destination and everything in between. We have young people who are Lum and Abner fans because they discovered it on the internet. Just a little bit of everything, old people, young people, we have it all. Things change so rapidly today and we're saving those eras that are long, long gone now. It just disappears uh, as soon as it's old-fashioned. As soon as the recovery after World War II, you got rid of the old stuff. It was just old stuff and we're preserving that whole era. Things from the late 1800s, early 1900s. People come in here to look around and say, my grandmother had one of those. I wonder what happened to it. Most of our grandmother's mother's things are, are long gone. We can't save everything, but we're glad to be able to save an example of everything. Well, what a fun trip. My gosh, and the memories. Now it's time to get all of this unpacked. You know, I think travel is much more about just going to the sites. Think about all the great people you meet all the things that you get to see that, well, you can only imagine unless you encounter them firsthand. Travel's a great way to change your perspective on the world and also discover some new things. I hope I'll see you soon when we can visit again. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. See, that's the thing I don't know. Do I have a side? Is that why y'all don't want to film well, me over there? Because I have a bad side? Let's decide. Let's decide. We'll decide if you Which decide. side? <laughs> no talky talky. No talky. Okay. Indoor voices. Indoor voices. Good. Good.